Jason! Nick Jason! An unexpected guest fell down into a German trench. The NCO, a seasoned veteran of the Eastern Front, immediately took note of the deserter's cap. There was no customary red star on it. The man was from a punishment battalion. During his interrogation, the deserter told the Germans about the coming Soviet offensive. The man's punishment battalion had been due to attack in the first wave. He had become convinced that he would not survive. The German high command took the deserter's information seriously. The Vistula Front in central Poland had stabilized by the autumn of 1944. Weeks passed, but the expected Red Army offensive did not materialize. German forces were withdrawn from Poland for a counterattack in the Ardennes. The 4th SS Panzer Corps was pulled out of Warsaw and sent to Hungary. The front defending the road to Berlin had been stripped bare. But the Soviet offensive had only been postponed. Die Tatsache, dass der Feind nicht zum Angriff kommt, wird durch das Wetter verursacht. Er braucht Frost und gute Durchsichtigkeit, damit er seine Flugzeuge verwenden kann. The German units in Poland had been rehearsing new tactics to counter the initial Red Army onslaught. The initial Soviet artillery barrage would often wipe out German units holding the front line of trenches. So the Germans decided that, at the last moment, they would withdraw the infantry to the second line, two to three kilometers to the rear. Every three to 500 meters, they dug communication trenches connecting the two lines. The Soviet bombardment would fall on empty trenches, while the infantry prepared to meet the Soviet assault from the second line. Most of the barbed wire and obstacles were placed between the first and second lines. The Germans prepared to fall back at any moment. Behind them, Panzer divisions, including the new King Tigers, were ready to counterattack. Soviet intelligence had severely underestimated the strength of the enemy's reserves. The Wehrmacht was preparing to fight for Germany. They would bleed their enemies white and force them to accept peace on their terms. A new Soviet trick was to play loud music from the trenches. It drowned out the noise of tanks and gun tractors as they moved up for the attack. Finally, on the 12th of January, they put on a new record. Through the grey dawn and across the snow-covered plain came the sound of an unbreakable union of free-born republics, the national anthem of the USSR.
As the last words of the anthem faded, there was a short pause, and then the roar of hundreds of guns. German infantry streamed back through the communication trenches. The first shells landed as the Germans were still falling back to the second line. They expected a long bombardment of the forward trenches, but it was only a short barrage. By the time the infantry reached their new positions, the Soviet guns were pummeling the second line with all their remaining ammunition. The German army's new defensive tactics had failed on this occasion. But the German command still had its armoured reserve. At Kielce, a German heavy tank battalion with 72 Tigers and King Tigers launched its counter-attack. By early 1945, most Soviet tank regiments had been re-equipped with the new T-34-85. This tank had a much more powerful, long-barreled 85mm gun. It gave the crews a much better chance against heavily armoured German tanks like the Tiger and Panther. At Lysov, the Tigers were ambushed by the Soviet 61st Guards Tank Brigade. After a ferocious battle, the Tiger Battalion was defeated. Around Kielce, the Germans counter-attacked with more than 350 tanks and self-propelled guns but they failed to halt the advance of two Soviet tank armies. The German panzer divisions were encircled and destroyed. Other counter-attacks by German armored units at Puava and Magnushev were also unsuccessful. On the 17th of January, 1945, the Red Army entered Warsaw. A giant breach had been made in the German front line. Red Army tanks advanced so fast that they overran airfields where German aircraft were still being refueled. Near Lublin, they captured 60 Luftwaffe aircraft at one airfield. But in East Prussia, the third Bielorussian front had less success. Here, intelligence work proved much more difficult. The local German population was fiercely hostile. Many reconnaissance patrols never returned from their mission. Reconnaissance failed to detect the withdrawal of German forces, so the artillery bombardment did fall on empty frontline trenches. The Germans were falling back to Königsberg. The Soviet Air Force had been grounded by blizzards and was unable to support the attack. Fifteen days into the offensive, the second Ukrainian front approached the grey huts of the Auschwitz concentration camp, surrounded by its guard towers and electrified fences. Auschwitz was, in fact, a network of more than 40 camps, of which Auschwitz-Birkenau was the largest. The rapid advance of the Red Army forced the Germans to hurriedly shut down operations at this factory of death. Himmler issued orders for the camp to be liquidated. Surviving prisoners were to be evacuated or killed, and all the apparatus of extermination was to be demolished with dynamite. 60,000 emaciated prisoners were marched away on foot. Amongst them was Soviet partisan Irina Karina. We walked, column after column, guarded by SS men and surrounded by dogs. The snow was soaked with blood. It was pink, because anyone who fell behind, tripped or stopped, was shot on the spot. 
The last crematorium was blown up 24 hours before the Red Army arrived. At the last minute, the SS shot around 700 prisoners, hoping to silence the last witnesses. But in their rush to escape the approaching Soviet tanks, the SS failed to carry out all its tasks. The Red Army found 7,500 starved prisoners inside the camp and enough evidence to work out what had happened there. They found mountains of personal belongings taken from the dead. The victims at this camp alone, 90% of them Jews, numbered 1.1 million. As the Red Army advance continued, the first Ukrainian front under Marshal Ivan Konyev met determined resistance around the industrial region of Silesia. So he chose another approach. To drive the enemy from this vast sprawl of factories and plants would cost men and time. And Stalin wanted the factories intact. He described this region to Marshal Konyev as pure gold. And so, with the agreement of the general staff, Konyev allowed the Germans to escape from Silesia. A corridor six kilometers wide was left open to the south, through which the Germans withdrew. By the end of January, the entire region was under Soviet control. When Albert Speer, Hitler's Minister of Armaments, sent the Führer a memorandum on the significance of the loss of Silesia, it began with the words, the war is lost. After the destruction of the Ruhr industries by Allied bombing, Silesian mines provided 60% of German coal. With the loss of Silesia, 1945's coal output would be one quarter of the previous years, and her steel output, just one-sixth. Speer continued. With the loss of Silesia, German industry will not be able to meet the front's requirement for ammunition, weapons and tanks. It meant defeat within the year. But this information was kept within Hitler's inner circle. Hitler continued to demand self-sacrifice and fanatical resistance from his followers. To salvage the disastrous situation on the Eastern Front, he turned to one of his oldest allies, SS Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler. Hitler appointed him head of the newly formed Army Group Vistula, despite his total lack of experience of military command. One man who was appalled by this decision was the talented Panzer General Heinz Guderian, now chief of the Army General Staff. Guderian, knowing Himmler would need all the help he could get, appointed Walter Wenck, an experienced staff officer, as his chief of staff. Hitler gave this role to Himmler because he believed only a true Nazi could instill the troops with the necessary fanaticism to defeat the enemy. It was an illustration of how far the Führer had become detached from reality. Soviet tank crews walked amongst snow-covered aircraft at the Poznania airfield. Dozens of Heinkel 111s grounded by lack of fuel. The days of the Third Reich were numbered. But the German garrison of Poznania was in no hurry to surrender. The commander of the first tank army, General Katukov, soon found that the city was a tank crew's worst nightmare. Narrow streets and well-prepared killing zones. Katukov was authorized to continue the advance to Berlin, 
Poznanie would be left to General Chuikov, the hero of Stalingrad, and his 8th Guards Army. Chuikov's orders were to take Poznanie by storm. It lay in a crucial position at the heart of the local road and rail network. Chuikov's troops began their assault on the 26th of January. Chuikov left an escape route open to the west. He hoped the Germans would withdraw so he could take the city quickly and at minimal cost. But the besieged garrison made no attempt to break out. This was a real fortress, held by 20,000 Germans behind three-metre-thick stone walls. Soviet artillery pounded away at the city's 18th-century fortifications to limited effect. Hitler had advocated the fortress or Festung strategy in 1943. It meant holding designated fortresses at all costs, even after they had become completely cut off. In Ukraine and Belarusia, the strategy found little support amongst his generals. But by 1945, as the fighting reached German soil, fewer generals were willing to stand up to the Fuhrer. A Festung that held important road and rail junctions made it difficult for the Red Army to resupply its forward units. On the other hand, the strategy meant valuable German units became trapped and isolated. The second assault on Poznanie began on the 28th of January. Chuikov preceded it with an ultimatum to the garrison. I, General Chuikov, propose that you lay down your arms and surrender. I guarantee your life and that you will return home after the war. Otherwise, you will be destroyed. Few of the defenders took up the offer. The garrison commander, Major General Gonel, was a dedicated Nazi. He had no intention of surrendering. Meanwhile, Katukov's tanks had bypassed Poznanie and were heading west towards Berlin. But at the old Polish-German border, they encountered the Ostwall, the East Wall. The Ostwall was an old fortified line, which Germany had begun building along its border with Poland in 1934. But in 1938, Hitler decided that these defences were no longer a priority and halted further work on the line. In 1944, as the Red Army closed in, the fortifications were hurriedly prepared for action. The line was composed of a series of redoubts called Panzerwerks. Reinforced steel cupolas provided firing points, and the approaches were covered by concrete anti-tank obstacles known as Dragon's Teeth. The Panzerwerks held enough food, water and ammunition to hold out for weeks. The problem for the German high command was finding the men to garrison them. Only ragtag units could be spared, and many of these arrived late. One Soviet tank brigade drove straight through unmanned fortifications. But a few hours later, the German army arrived and began digging sections of rail into the road, making it impassable for tanks. The next brigade to come down the road ran into fierce resistance. The brigade in front had been cut off. All attempts to break through were unsuccessful. The armoured cupolas were impervious to tank rounds, and in the rapid advance, the infantry and heavy artillery had been left far behind. That night, the men listened to the sounds of heavy fighting behind the German line, where their comrades were cut off. If German reserves arrived, 
the brigade would be wiped out. But not all sections of the Ostwall were held with such determination. The men holding the line near Schwibus didn't even have uniforms. They were men of the Volkssturm. Towards the end of 1944, with the German army increasingly short of manpower, Hitler authorized the raising of a national militia. It was called the Volkssturm, and Hitler confidently believed it would raise six million men and initiate a people's war against the invader. These hopes were wildly optimistic. At Poznanie, the Nazis hoped to raise 24 Volkssturm battalions, but could raise only one. All German males between 16 and 60 were eligible for conscription into the Volkssturm. The punishment for desertion was death. To ensure Volkssturm battalions possessed the necessary fanaticism to defeat the enemy, they were placed under the command of the Gauleiters, the local Nazi party bosses, rather than under army control. The Volkssturm received few weapons and little ammunition, although they had plenty of Panzerfaust anti-tank weapons. They received no uniforms, just an armband, which they wore over their civilian clothing. Predictably, such units proved ineffective in combat. At Schwibus, they could do little to hold up the Soviet First Guards Tank Brigade. The trapped Soviet brigade was rescued, and the advance continued to the Oder River. Similar events unfolded to the north at Meseritz. The 60-year-old Oberleutnant Hermann Stepp, commander of the 128th Volkssturm Battalion, described what happened to his Soviet captors. Als ich in Doppelfernglas die Panzer sah, sagte ich, dass wenn wir nicht schießen würden, würden die Russen auch dies nicht tun. Und so ist es geschehen. Wir haben die Weißenflagge aufgestellt und sind dann drauf. The Volkssturm surrendered the defences around Meseritz without firing a shot. The Red Army broke through to the Oder and established bridgeheads just 70 kilometers from Berlin. Only there was the advance halted by the arrival of German reserves. By February 1945, the Soviet First Belarusian Front had fought its way across Germany to within 70 kilometers of the capital, Berlin. In just three weeks, across a 500-kilometer front, the Red Army had advanced 500 kilometers. Thousands of German civilians fled their homes, fearing the vengeance of the Red Army. Their fears proved well justified. Soviet soldiers had long been taught to despise their enemy. Germany was the lair of the fascist beast, and many set out to avenge bitter grievances. Amongst them was Yevgeny Basunov. We entered towns and saw two-story houses with nice tiled roofs. At first, we would set fire to these houses. We couldn't forget the sight of our own villages burned to the ground with only chimneys standing amongst the ashes.
it was not just property that felt the wrath of the Red Army. Soviet soldiers, many fueled by alcohol, were responsible for the rape of thousands of German women, many of whom they then murdered. Prisoners and civilians were frequently shot out of hand. Some Soviet soldiers were, for a time, out of control. Lazar Tsents was with the Red Army. In 1945, nobody would lay their hands on prisoners. But in 1944, vigilantism was common. Once, a master sergeant that I didn't know took five Germans outside and started shooting them one by one. I approached him, took his gun and said, you better kill them in battle. The looting of German property was systematic. The soldiers gathered luxuries they'd never known before. Jars of stewed fruit, jam and stewed meat. They took anything that was in short supply back home, including clothes, fabric and shoes. Hey, народ! Смотри, что на дыбал! Штиблеты хоть сейчас на свадьбу! А покажи свои! А у меня новые вообще! Ну, у меня старые! Нет! Да Давай, ладно! Ой, какие! Хорош, хорош! Эй, земляк! Давай с нами! Давай меняться! У тебя не твой размер! Я же вижу! Эй, постой! There was even an official postal service for sending loot back home to families. Privates could send five kilograms per month, officers ten. As the advance continued, commanders recognized that the brutal treatment of German civilians was inspiring the enemy to fight harder. They tried to clamp down on such behavior. Nevertheless, many officers continued to turn a blind eye to their men's behavior. As the Red Army entered East Prussia, Stalin himself was persuaded to issue an order forbidding the mistreatment of German civilians. Similar orders were issued by the military councils of the various fronts and armies. One order, signed by Marshal Rokossovsky, commanding the 2nd Bielorussian Front, urged all ranks to eradicate all activities shameful to the Red Army with the force of a red-hot iron. Задействие, несовместимые со званием бойца Красной Армии, виновные приговорены к расстрелу. In February 1945, as Churchill, Roosevelt and Stalin gathered at Yalta to decide the future of post-war Europe, recent Red Army successes put Stalin in a strong position. The Western Allies made major concessions to Stalin over the Soviet-Polish border. They allowed the Soviet Union to keep much of the territory it had seized from Poland in 1939, including the city of Lvov, although Białystok would be returned. In compensation, Poland would receive German territory east of the Oder and most of East Prussia. A final decision was reached on the demilitarization and denazification of Germany. It is our inflexible purpose to destroy German militarism and Nazism and to ensure that Germany will never again be able to disturb the peace of the world. Germany was to be divided into four zones of occupation. In addition to the USSR, USA and Great Britain, one would also go to France. The German capital, situated in the Soviet zone, would itself be divided into four zones. Churchill pushed Stalin to commit to free and fair elections in Poland so that the country might choose its own government. 
Stalin agreed, but it was a promise he would never honor. Stalin made a further promise, that the USSR would join the war against Japan within 90 days of Germany's surrender. Meanwhile, at Poznanyi, Chuikov's 8th Guards Army cleared German defenders from the rubble. The 2nd Assault Engineer Brigade prepared to storm the city's fortifications. Their main obstacle was a fire-swept moat, 10 metres wide and 8 metres deep. Under the cover of a smokescreen, the engineers rolled barrels filled with explosives into position. The fuse was to be lit at the last moment, and the barrel rolled forward into the moat. The explosion would kill German soldiers at their loopholes. Soviet assault groups waited to cross the moat and capture the wall. Within lay the citadel, Fort Vignari. These formidable fortifications were held by several thousand diehards under the command of the fanatical Major General Ernst Gornel. The assault began on the 18th of February. Heavy artillery opened fire on the forts at point-blank range. The guns blew breaches in the walls wide enough for men to get through. Now, the barrels of explosives were lit and rolled into the moat. Survivors were left deafened and concussed. The assault groups crossed the moat using ladders and duckboards and fought their way into the city. The engineers built a bridge over the moat to get tanks and self-propelled guns into the city. The armoured vehicles brought resistance to an end. The month-long siege was over. General Gonel lay down on a swastika flag and shot himself. His deputy, General Matter, led more than 4,000 survivors into captivity. But elsewhere, the Nazis planned a last desperate counterattack to save Berlin. Heinrich Himmler, the commander of Army Group Vistula, hoped to turn the tables on the Red Army as it approached Berlin. His staff planned a counterattack by the 11th SS Panzer Army. Operation Solstice would be launched from Pomerania against the northern flank of Zhukov's first Belarusian front. The Waffen SS grew out of the paramilitary wing of the Nazi party. In 1939, it had just three regiments, which proved unreliable in combat. But as the war went on, the Waffen SS expanded to more than 30 divisions and forged a reputation as an elite fighting force. Its units were the first to receive new equipment. By 1945, the Waffen SS was a multinational force, its divisions manned by volunteers from across Europe. 
Many were now gathered in Pomerania, including the SS Nordland, Nederland, Wallonian, Langmark, Frunsberg, and Politzai. The German counterattack began on the 16th of February, 1945. But it could make little headway against Bilov's 61st Army and Bogdanov's 2nd Guards Tank Army. Then came Zhukov's response. He redirected two Soviet tank armies against the German forces in Pomerania. Within five days, T-34s from the tank armies of Katukov and Bogdanov had reached the Baltic Sea, trapping German forces who desperately sought to escape by sea. After this catastrophe, Hitler allowed Heinrich Himmler to resign his command of Army Group Vistula. Most Soviet guns were modern designs from the 1930s, but some were much older. The 305 mm howitzers still bore the double-headed eagle of the Romanovs. Their target was the fortress city of Königsberg, capital of East Prussia. In early April, there was a lull across much of the front. But here, the battle raged. The walls had to be smashed, and the Air Force could not help. It had been grounded again by bad weather. The heavy siege guns fired one round every three minutes. There would be four days of this before the assault began. Königsberg was defended by a series of modernized 19th century forts, their thick walls protected by tons of earth. But the Red Army bombardment was overwhelming. By 1945, the German situation in East Prussia was desperate. In late January, Soviet troops had reached the Vistula Lagoon, cutting off all German forces in East Prussia. Communication with the rest of Germany was only possible by sea. But the Germans stubbornly fought on. When the commander of the Third Belorussian Front was killed in action, Stalin sent Marshal Vasilevsky to replace him. Stalin urged him to secure a swift liquidation of the enemy to allow the Red Army to reinforce its assault on Berlin. But after assessing the situation, Vasilevsky decided against an immediate assault. He ordered three more weeks of preparation. First, he ordered an attack on German forces pinned against the coast southwest of Königsberg. The pocket was eliminated in late March. Now, it was time to attack the city itself. The Red Army had assembled a quarter of a million men for the final assault on Königsberg. They were supported by more than 5,000 guns and 500 armored vehicles they conducted a thorough aerial reconnaissance of the city and its approaches. Soviet intelligence estimated the Königsberg garrison to be about 60,000 strong. It turned out to be a serious underestimate. The final assault began on the 6th of April, 1945. The partially destroyed outlying forts offered no serious resistance. But on the approaches to the city, the Soviet advance bogged down. There were more Germans than they had reckoned with, and the Air Force was still grounded by bad weather. But on the 7th of April, the skies cleared. 500 Soviet bombers appeared overhead. 
the Luftwaffe was nowhere to be seen. Thousands of bombs rained down on the city. After the bombing, chaos reigned in Königsberg. Communications across the city had been cut. On the 8th of April, the remnants of the garrison were driven back into the centre and east of the city. Communications with the port of Pilau were cut. Further resistance was pointless. The next day, the garrison surrendered. The true number of casualties was lost amidst the chaos and the propaganda. The Red Army claimed more than 40,000 enemy dead. It took up to 70,000 prisoners. Soviet casualties were up to 60,000, many more than were reported at the time. Königsberg had been virtually destroyed. The East Prussian campaign had reached its conclusion. The victorious Soviet forces rolled west once more to prepare for the final battle. The second Belarusian front would now take up positions along the River Oder. And then all would be in place for the final assault on Berlin. <laughs> 